So it is uh, Thursday night, uh, right before Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. Normally, when I do these video log things, uh, I typically do a bunch of sort of entries in the week or so prior to the tournament, uh, and then sort of give my experiences as the tournament progresses. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm doing this as my first entry because my sort of preparation was a little shall we say, uh, less intensive and less thorough than it has in the past. Um, I had a number of commitments that prevented me from uh, really being able to put in the same kind of time uh, into testing that I have many times previously preparing for tournaments. And uh, I only actually came out to uh, the Milwaukee area on Monday. I say the Milwaukee area because there was a bit of miscommunication between me and the group that I was working with. Uh, I tested with the same group that I did last time, uh, including Brad Nelson, Jerry Thompson, uh, Chris Fennell, Ari Lax, a whole bunch of people who I'm sure that, that I will forget some of if I try to name them all. Um, so I'm not going to really go to, <laughs> to it have to try to name every single person. But um, there, about, there are uh, 17 total people. And a bunch of them went to the Grand Prix in Madison um, and neglected to inform me that the place that they had sort of rented to test was actually right by Madison rather than by Milwaukee. So I flew into Milwaukee uh, on Monday, actually directly from San Francisco, where I was doing uh, commentary for uh, the Hearthstone Americas Championship, uh, and then you know discovered that uh, I was actually like two hours away from where I needed to be. And uh, after a very, very expensive Uber ride, I finally made it. Um, but the sort of lack of organization was something of a theme as the same sort of issue came up uh, last night when we were uh, preparing to come to Milwaukee. And uh, we were like, yeah, you know, saying, well, they didn't have enough cars to get everyone, drive everyone from, uh, from the house that they were renting uh, to Milwaukee. And they said, oh, well, we'll just take an Uber there. Um, but it turns out that the house was sort of in the middle of nowhere and there just aren't any Ubers there. So that was not an option. So ultimately someone ended up driving uh, like a, a group of people in the middle of the night because this was this is something that like, couldn't be resolved somehow um, by someone renting a car, for instance. Um, but uh, anyway, someone, you know, drove an entire carload of people in the middle of the night to Milwaukee and back, which is like a two hour drive. So each way. Um, so yeah, that was that was interesting. But as far as the actual preparation for the tournament itself, some of that happened too. Um, like I said, not as much as uh, in many of my sort of previous uh, tournament experiences. But going in, it was pretty clear that the most important decks to be uh, aware of and prepared for uh, were Green White, Atarka Red, and Jeskai. Those are the decks that have had the sort of best, best performances. Uh, over the past several weeks of the standard format during the Star City Games Opens, uh, and you know, are clearly very powerful decks. So, uh, many people would probably think, oh, Green White's great in the format, you probably want to play it, but green, when, when people are trying to beat a deck like Green White, they can do it. Green White isn't the sort of deck that like is so powerful that if it's what people are expecting to play against, that, you know, you're not going to be able to, to they're not going to be able to beat you. It's not, some, not something like you know, mono black devotion that has thought seeds that can deal with whatever hate card your opponent has, or something like affinity that just has so much raw power that you know you you will often be able to, to just bowl over people even if they're intending to planning to beat you. Um, similarly, I think Jeskai and Atarka Red are strong decks, but not tremendous decks. Uh, I think Atarka Red is is again a deck that people are going to be targeting because I think it's a natural deck for people to look at to try to beat Green White, which is weird because normally. You think of green-white decks as being excellent against red decks, but the nature of these red decks with the Become Immense Team or Battle Rage sort of combo kill uh, is one that the green-white decks don't really have a ton of interaction against, so are ultimately uh, quite weak to. So uh, I was testing a variety of different decks. Uh, the, the, what I tried to play the most was some varieties of like sort of teamer-ish base like dragon decks. Um, because my feeling was that I think Draconic Roar is a great card. It's one of the best removal spells in the format. Uh, I actually was trying to build decks with Radiant Flames, and specifically decks with Radiant Flames that had creatures that survive Radiant Flames, like Savage Knuckleblade. Um, so I was playing these 
Dragon, Savage Knuckle Blade, Woodland Wanderer, sort of mid-rangey style decks. Probably not to surprise anyone that I'm trying to play with, you know, big green creatures um, and uh, and stuff like that. Um, but the, the decks just weren't good enough. Uh, it's possible that I just didn't have sort of enough time to to make them good. It's possible that the kind of thing that they were doing just isn't really that powerful. Um, I, I felt like the, the, the best cards in the decks were like, like Knuckle Blade was actually quite good. Um, Stubborn Denial was excellent. Uh, Thunder, Blo- Thunder Break Regent was very good. Roar was great. But a lot of the sort of sur- uh, surrounding cast... Oh, Woodland Wonder was great. But a lot of the surrounding cast wasn't really that great. I ultimately just kind of gave up and didn't feel like I had enough time to develop something that, that might have been good. I think it's possible that there's something there with, like, maybe your, maybe your base Abzan instead of base Teamer. Um, and you can p- potentially play maybe even Anafenza um, and... Uh, Siege Rhino, along with Radiant Flames, those seem like powerful cards together. But I wanted to play uh, the Roar and Regent. That's hard to do in, if you're not like a base red uh, clan or shard or whatever. But regardless, uh, I ended up moving away from that actually super late, like yesterday. I was the deck, was like yesterday morning. I was still playing uh, playing with the deck, and uh, I got to talking to people about. You know, my perspective in the format, and, and a number of people were talking about playing green-white, other people were playing green-red, and neither of the decks really seemed great to me. Um, it didn't seem like playing... I did think that playing a green-white re- white deck was great when people are trying to beat your green-white deck, even if your green-white deck is, like, better in the mirror and better against certain, you know, certain things. Uh, and I didn't think that playing a Tarka Red or Tarka Red style of deck, A, is something I particularly enjoy. Those decks are not really my um, sort of play style, my forte. Um, and... Also, I, I feel similarly that I think that it's going to be a, a deck that people will target and people will be aware of because it is pretty clearly a deck that people are looking to play and has had success as well. It, was, you know, it won the first Star City Open series. It's the most popular deck on Magic Online. So even though red decks are tr- traditionally overrepresented on Magic Online, I think people are, are aware of how powerful and popular the decks like it to be. Just try to find something that I thought was good against both those decks. Um, and... Um, Brad Nelson mentioned that Tom Ross had had sent him like a Mardu Dragons list. And that sounded like something that, that, that was interesting to me because Mardu, I think, actually has a lot of powerful cards. Um, the thing like Seeker of the Way is great. Crackling Doom is very good. Um, and like I said, I was really trying to play with Draconic Roar and Thunderbrick Regent. A big part of why those two cards are good is because they match up very well against Gideon and also just great removal spells against like Jeskai or Green, green White uh, or Green Red. So... Uh, I, I was I was interested in the idea of playing the Mardu deck, and I you know picked it up um, and played a little bit with it, and felt kind of clunky and needed some tuning. Um, but I liked the core idea, of what was going on, and the biggest thing that really excited me was actually when I thought about playing Painful Truths. Um, one of the problems that Mardu decks often have is again they're sort of clunky and that they're kind of traditional uh, mid range style of decks, which means that. You're going to have a mix of cards if you draw the wrong cards at the wrong time, like you have these removal spells and these creatures. But your removal is good against almost everyone, and your creatures are, you know, reasonable threats against pretty much everyone. Um, but you didn't really have great ways to, like, piece things together. A lot of decks play Outpost Siege, which is kind of slow, kind of clunky, weak to Dramoka's Command. Um, doesn't really get you going quickly. And you don't really want to be playing, like, a, a pure attrition style of game, which is what... Um, what Outpost Siege really sets you to do. But with Painful Truths, um, you just draw three for three mana. And that's a super powerful effect. Obviously, the life loss is a pretty big deal, but you have uh, Soulforge Grandmaster, Soulforge, <laughs> Freudian slip there, uh, Soulfire Grandmaster, um, you have Seeker of the Way, you have the Lifelink land. Uh, actually getting to play one of the, the, the creature lands is a huge deal too. And, and the more I played with it, both Painful Truths and the deck in general, the more I liked it. Um, the, one of the biggest things is that it's a deck that can play defense very effectively, but can turn the corner quickly. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I... Uh, how I define sort of what I like in mid-range decks are decks that uh, they can take different postures at different stages of the game, depending on, on what's important. Um, and you know, a deck that has like the ability to be aggressive when it's in the right matchup, a deck that has the tools to switch to defensive posture, and in particular when the deck can have pivot points that, you know, once you, you get to certain, a certain point, like, you can actually win quickly and take control of the game quickly. And one of the things that I, I found uh, really powerful against the Martyr Dragon deck was 
between like just getting attacks in with Seeker of the Way and Crackling Doom, opponents fetching, like people take a lot of incidental damage against you, and then uh, Futterbrick Regent, oh, and Draconic Roar, um, but with Colagon in particular, you do a lot of damage really quickly. Like Colagon dashed alongside Thunderbrick Regent, just the two of them does 12 damage. And it's like, that can just kill someone in turn 5 who's fetched twice and you've crackling doing them and then you hit them once with a guy. It's like, you're just dead. And like, for a deck that has so much removal and and so much, many like powerful utility cards in it, uh, the ability to have that kind of explosive kill is, is really impressive. Um, but also, Regent and Sarkhan, uh, the Dragon Speaker, uh, and Colgon are all extremely good at pressuring Gideon, which is one of the very good cards in a lot of the decks. Um, so just generally speaking, I think the deck's very solid, has a lot of great tools, um, as well as, I think, uh, being positioned very well against the like, strong decks in the in the metagame. It's not like a deck that's like, okay, this is just built to beat green-red and, and green-white, but can't fight, uh, can't really fight elsewhere. Like, you just have a lot of, like I said, good, powerful, proactive tools. Uh, they just happen to line up very well against what we expect the, the metagame to largely break out to be. So... Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Um, I think Jerry Thompson is playing the same deck. Well, I know Jerry is. It's possible that a couple other people might also end up getting on the deck. Uh, most of the people, as I said, are playing green, white, or green, red. I guess it's green, white, or red, green, really. But uh, but yeah, I, I you know, despite not really having that much time to practice, I'm actually feeling pretty confident, at least it constructed. I've only done like a handful of drafts. I'm actually going to finish this and go do a draft in Magic Online. So hopefully I can get a little bit more experience. But... Uh, that I definitely feel a bit shakier on, and that was, in fact, my downfall at the last event. Uh, though there, I actually felt pretty confident going into draft, so who knows? Maybe maybe I'll, uh, I'll just have some beginner's luck in this format with my, you know, single-digit drafts under my belt and, and do well. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm not not really expecting to do particularly well in this tournament. Uh, like I said, I didn't put in a lot of preparation, but... Uh, I, I haven't really even played in Magic events lately. The last event I played in was the Grand Prix the week after the last Pro Tour. It just had a lot of other things going on. You know, the whole getting married thing that, that kind of uh, kind of had me busy for a bit. I love Magic. I love the Pro Tour. Gonna give it my all now that I'm here, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So I do like the opportunity to smash people with dragons. It's kind of what I like to do, so let's do it. <laughs> Friday night after day one of the Pro Tour, and uh, I have the thoroughly uninspiring record of four and four. Um, I, uh, I started the day uh, at the feature draft pod, so if you want to go see my draft, you can take a look at it in the draft you are in the coverage. Maybe I'll remember to link that in the in the comments or whatever, um, or in the info. But, uh... You know, going in, as I said yesterday, I didn't really have a ton of a chance to practice draft. I had only drafted like five times, uh, and I found myself uh, drafting a deck that I never really drafted before, which is Red Green Landfall. And uh, I, as far as I could tell, uh, I drafted you know pretty well given what was uh, what was available to me. Uh, I actually opened up uh, on a couple of cards for other other decks and moved into the Red Green Landfall deck because it seemed like it was clearly uh, clearly a open signal all around me, really. Um, but it's possible that's the case because there's just not a good Red Green Landfall deck to be built. Uh, I showed my deck to a lot of people, and they said that it looked great. They said that it looked like one of the best you know Red Green Landfall decks they'd seen. Um, and I unfortunately finished one and two, and not all that many of my games felt super competitive. Um, I would like just play a guy, you know, hit my opponent for uh, you know a little bit, and then they'd play, you know, like a one four or or an o five or something, and suddenly like my ability to deal damage was was seriously impeded, and that was like kind of how all my games went. Um, I did have some close games. I was like one damage off killing one of my opponents. Uh, if I if I drawn like a mountain instead of a forest, I would have killed him with my Aku and Hellkite or whatever. Um, and then I had another match where you know again it was like really close and came down to. Um, came down to, you know, a couple of draws, but overall, just my deck felt, like, pretty outclassed, so I think I'll try and avoid that for the draft tomorrow, but, uh, in, in standard, I, uh, 
after my one-two start in draft, uh, I ended up three and two uh, playing my Martyr Dragon deck. Uh, the deck felt good, though a little bit clunky at times. Uh, not necessarily clunky, but but it's a deck that really misses temples because it's a deck that that has a lot of a lot of things going on that are that are you know good in certain certain situations in certain matchups. Um, like I beat a uh, a Tarka Red deck first. Then I, I beat Kai playing uh, some sort of Grixis splash white deck or something like that. Though he basically, we basically didn't play a match because he just had horrible draws. Then I uh, lost to an Atarka red deck in like a really interesting and close game uh, and match. Uh, like I was at one for multiple turns and ended up two damage away from, from being able to kill him uh, on like my last turn before he killed me. So I then beat a Bant Megamorph deck. Uh, again, it's a pretty interesting game. They got totally blown out by a Hidden Dragon Slayer in one of them, uh, and then blew him out with uh, with Soulforge Grandmaster, just you know killing it, his stuff and returning for like five, six turns or more in uh, in game three. Uh, and then I lost to another Mardu deck, um, and we actually had some pretty interesting games uh, back and forth in the first couple of games. Uh, he was playing not dragons, but just a Mardu like Planeswalker style deck. He actually had some of the cards that I was looking at possibly playing, like. Uh, Pia and Kieran, which is a card that I was looking at possibly even playing in our Martyr Dragons deck, just because it seems really strong in any sort of attrition battle. Uh, also goes very well with Hangerback Walker, which he had uh, quite a number of. Uh, but he had like Gideon and Soren, where and like Mardu Charm, which is pretty interesting. Uh, whereas you know he didn't have the Dragon package, but uh, but we split the first two games in really interesting games, and then in, in game three I just kind of had a land heavy hand, uh, and he just played a turn four Outpost Siege, and it just overwhelmed me. So excuse me. Um, so, you know, not, not the, the greatest day. I'm still able to play tomorrow, though. I did go, uh, did get the requisite four wins, so hopefully, uh, I can get some feedback from people on my draft, because it's in the draft viewer, and they can maybe, you know, tell me, uh, tell me if they think they would have done anything differently, maybe do a couple drafts of Magic Online tonight, uh, just kind of, you know, hope to run the tables tomorrow and have a shot at making top eight. So, uh, definitely, you know, definitely a rough position to be in at four and four, but, uh, I still do have a chance to try to put something together and make a, a good finish of this tournament, and that's what I'm going to try and do. So I'll be back tomorrow to let you know if I manage to do it. So it is Saturday night uh, after day two of the Pro Tour. And uh, today wasn't a bad day, but it wasn't a great day. Um, I came in at four and four, so it you know would take a lot for me to uh, to have put up a result that uh, I was particularly excited about. Basically, I'd have to go undefeated to make top sixteen. I didn't do that. <laughs> um, I, I actually had a pretty good start though. Uh, in the draft portion, I drafted a very good uh, Jund Ramp deck. Uh, I had Triple Eyeless Watcher, Brood Monitor, Brood Butcher, uh, alongside uh, Omnath, and uh, Breaker of Armies, Gruesome Slaughter, a bunch of just powerful stuff, and uh, managed to go 3-0, which was nice after going 1-2 and two in the draft the last time. Um, but getting back to Constructed, things didn't go quite as well. Uh, I ended up going 2-3 and three in Constructed today. Uh, I managed to beat uh, a green-white deck. I lost to a black-red dragon deck, an Atarka red deck, and uh, green-white. But basically, I think that ultimately I think that my deck just wasn't that good, which is unsurprising considering it was a deck that uh, pretty much decided to play based on very little testing and more just sort of, you know, just gut feeling that I didn't like the other decks available. Uh, I actually lost to Hao Shuan Huang, uh, who, incidentally, uh, amusingly enough, was on my uh, World of Warcraft Warsun Gulch Battle Group 9 team uh, for, like, a team league thing, like, over 10 years ago, or about 10 years ago, or something like that. And uh, he was Whirlwind. He was the warrior on my team. And I was Elendril the Hunter, and we we played in this this league thing, and it was, you know, whatever. I, I, I first met him in real, you know, in real life through Magic, you know, probably five or so years ago. Uh, it was the first time I actually played, but it was, it was pretty funny, you know, having that sort of connection with someone from previous gaming experience. But he beat me with a 
uh, black red dragons deck that I think was actually probably just a better version uh, of the sort of strategy that I was trying to do with with my Mardu dragons deck. I think I overvalued the power of uh, Seeker of the Way and Soulfire Grandmaster in part because the you know fa fairly limited testing that I did. Uh, was against a lot of decks that didn't necessarily have that much cheap removal for them. Even the red decks that we were playing and testing uh, had few, if any, wild slashes. So you just sort of dominate a lot of games with, with Seeker. Uh, but my Seeker and Grandmasters frequently just died uh, to removal spells, and you know I, I just they just weren't impactful enough. Whereas if I had, say, just four Hangerback Walkers, uh, for my cheap creatures, those cards would be relatively low impact uh, in my opponent's decks. But I think the, the red-black deck just seemed like it had better mana, uh, many of the same things going on. It had the, the Pia and Kieran, which I had experimented with a little bit, um, but just it just felt like it was a, a, a smoother version of the same basic strategy, which kind of makes me sad that I, you know, bothered playing the other one. Like, you know, the fact that I had a bunch of tap lands. Yes, I get I get access to creature lands, but they have the, the, the Shambling Vent wasn't particularly good for me. Um, it was okay over the course of the, the standard rounds, but never particularly great. Whereas, you know, just having tap lands and pain lands definitely uh, came back to haunt me in a number of spots. So, I don't know. Uh, not really terribly surprising that I didn't do all that well. I ended up finishing 9-7, and seven, uh, which gets me an extra pro point, but no, no, uh, no additional money on top of my appearance fee. Um, so, it, you know, not, not the finish that I, uh, I would have hoped for. You know, obviously hoped to win, but... Uh, you know, a, at least a reasonable result given that I didn't really do too much testing for this event. I feel like I played, I played pretty well. There were definitely spots where I could have played better uh, if I'd been more familiar with you know the cards in the limited format or the way that certain matchups interacted. Um, but I, I played a lot of really interesting games, and that's that's something that I can't say for a lot of events. A lot of events that I've played in, particularly events where I did poorly, uh, I often come out feeling like the experience itself was was pretty bad because, you know, whether I got mana screwed or whatever. Uh, but in this in this event, I actually played a lot of really interesting games, both that I won and that I lost. Um, so that was cool. It was it was nice to actually come out of an event, even though I didn't do particularly well, and feel like it was, you know, a positive experience and that I enjoyed the magic that I played here. Um, you always, when, it, when you do well in an event, you always feel good about it. When you do badly, in many cases, you leave with a negative feeling because in many cases you got really unlucky or whatever else. Um, and you know, I lost some. I lost some games because I stalled on land, but I won games because my opponent did too. Uh, but I, I had a lot of just really good games. So uh, one of the coolest was actually against Justin Cohen uh, in the limited portion today. Uh, I was playing my my you know ramp deck. He was playing a blue black deck, and he had the I had a Eldrazi Devastator with uh, his Titan Coils on it, and he had the uh, I don't remember what it's called, the, the enchantment that gives all your opposing creatures uh, minus one attack. And I had you know, uh, just not very many guys, but they're all, and they're all super weak, obviously, because of the, uh, the enchantment he has. Um, so I decide to use my Gruesome Slaughter to, to kill his Benthic Infiltrator, tapping my Eldrazi Devastator, my Brood Monitor, and my uh, Kozilex Attendant, I think it is, Kozilex Attendant, so I, I tap, I, I spent, you know, play a six mana spell and tap like twenty mana worth of permanence to kill his three mana creature, and ultimately ends up winning the game because uh, a million turns later he hasn't found any real way to win and he ends up getting decked. So it was pretty cool. That was, you know, a, certainly a very unique game. I just had, you know, a number of games where really just interesting things happened. So yeah, it was a good experience overall. Um, I'm debating, you know, whether I'm particularly interested in trying to play more of the standard format. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. I don't like the impact that Battle of Zendikar has had that much. Um, I like some of the individual cards. I really dislike the new lands and the amount of just shuffling and logistical time and, and, and fetching and everything that goes on. It's just, it's just kind of miserable. That is a very negative uh, thing in sort of the play experience. But, uh, but it does enable a lot of interesting strategies because the mana is so available to do a bunch of different things. So uh, I, I'm not sure what my next event will be, but uh, I, I'm certainly interested in exploring it more because it's uh, it's a format that I wish I had more time to prepare for because there's a lot of decks out there that look really cool that I would have liked to have had a chance to experiment with. I'll be back next time and uh, we'll see if I can do better. I don't know how much more preparation time I'm necessarily going to be putting in in the future. 
it's just kind of it's difficult for me to justify the sort of boot camping that a lot of people do for pro tours at this point you know now that i'm married and don't really want to be away for a week and a half two weeks to prepare for an event uh, i may look into trying to find people who are interested in testing online so i don't have to just travel away for so long and uh, and be away from natalie and shiro definitely had fun this 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 trip and this tournament and uh you know, I'm looking forward to playing some more Magic in the future. So uh, that's it. Thanks for watching. And uh, hopefully maybe you learned something from my experiences here. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.